everybody to the Finance Committee of the Scarborough Town Council uh, meeting uh, here on Tuesday, April 17, 2018. Uh, those present are Councilors Bayvine, Caiezo, and Councilor Donovan. Uh, I'll ask for a motion for approval of the minutes of April 10. So moved. Second. Any corrections or comments? And none approved. Unanimous. Thank you. Uh, budget review tonight uh, starts with uh, finance and assessing, and I will turn it over to. Can I just make a uh, request, Mr. Chairman? I just think that for the public that are that will be watching this, um, as if we could just mention that uh, the uh, the regular chair Peter Hayes is away on business, and that's why we've asked uh, Council Donovan to sit in. Thank you. But I wanted people to at least understand that. And we have uh, uh, finance and assessing uh, to start off, then the planning department, the police department, and the fire department. So I'll turn it over to finance and assessing. And David. So just say uh, we've got a lot to get through. We've got two hours, so let's just be mindful as we proceed. Uh, some of these uh, two larger departments are at the end, so just be mindful of that as we go forward. Good. Would it be okay if we kind of proceed uh, the way we've done in the past, uh, start with Revenues first and then move into uh, appropriations. That's tab three. I think that would be good. Thank tab you. three, page two. Yeah. And um, so as we start, we have three sections to discuss today. The first one is the revenue, the second one is our operating, and the third is we have one capital item. Uh, so we'll start in with revenues. We're showing about a 4.6% increase in overall revenues. I don't know if there's anything specific you have questions on or that we can answer for you. Excise revenues continue to come in favorably and we've anticipated an increase for next year <coughs> in the proposed budget. 250,000. 250,000, correct. Also, the uh, state of Maine has uh, Interest rates are set for unpaid taxes by the state of Maine. They've increased it from 7% to 8% this year. Uh, and that's, uh, so we've built in a smaller, a small increase for that as well. That's only for property taxes starting in next fiscal year. So all the prior ones will have whatever the current, that those interest rates were us created by. Good. Just a, a quick question on the excise tax. Um, we're projecting or predicting a 250,000 increase over current year. The current year for next year. Um, I know. I know we're trying to be conservative, um, and I'm also kind of expecting that cliff, cliff to kind of or peak. I guess maybe not cliff, but that peak to kind of happen. We're not seeing any indications at all of that moving forward so far. It's slowing down, but not. I think we'll we'll make this number next year. Okay. I think in, we're actually going to come in higher than this. In the, actually, 2017 actual was 5.875, so we mm -hmm. actually exceed our projection. So, yeah, we keep pushing it, but uh, the numbers suggest that that's a solid number. Okay. As interest rates continue to rise, though, I think that might slow down a little. And what are, are and not to get too deep into the weeds, do we look at like vehicle sales or anything, or, or to see kind of where that's coming, or we just kind of look at number trends, revenue trends over time? Revenue trends over time, okay. mostly based on, yeah. Okay. Good. We actually track this to the on a daily basis. We know how much uh, we're receiving in, in, uh, in, on a monthly as well, just to get a sense of are we going to finish out the year. Yep. Typically, we do finish the fourth quarter pretty strong. So we expect the same. Any other questions on that? Then we Anything can else? go. Let's move, let's move to expenditures. Expenditures starts uh, in tab four on page. 16 and there are three divisions of finance the first one is the accounting office upstairs assessing office downstairs and the revenue office on this floor and overall we're looking at about a 5.6 percent increase the major factors for that, that increase have to do with uh, in the revenue office we had a full-timer retire a year and a half or so ago, we tried to do a couple of three part-timers in that person's place. Uh, we found that training those folks took much longer than it would to train a full-timer because they're not here all the time. And 
we kept losing them. So in the, the three we've hired, four we've hired, we've lost two of them. And so at the last time we met with the manager and the HR director and petitioned to change those two part-time positions to full-time. Um, so that started partway through this year and we're budgeting for the full annual position next year. And then the second position has to do with assessing. Uh, we also tried to put in for a full-time position there and uh, seeing what the budget was doing. We dropped it down and I'll let Dave talk to, to the rest of that, if you have any. Well, we've, uh, we've been using the subcontractor uh, for about a year now to do field work. Um, April Buchanan, uh, she's, she gives us about 16 hours a week but uh, we haven't had a full-time assessor in about three years, and we've been behind. Uh, and with the market the way it is, uh, we're getting a lot of activity in, in terms of sales and, and uh, uh, declarations coming in and so on. So we put in for another position. Um, it, I think it's long overdue. This department has had three people uh, since at least the 1980s. Uh, but anyway, uh, what we'd like to do is maintain this subcontractor and uh, either use April or, or someone else if, if she doesn't continue uh, to do field work for us. So that, that position isn't reflected in salaries, benefits, and wages. It's reflected in contracted services, correct? correct. Okay. Right. Yeah. Okay. My conversations with, with Dave and staff, um, I just couldn't see it fit to fund the full-time position, but I, I do see the value in having additional field work. Um, a lot of this is the new construction, getting out and, and viewing the properties for the first time, and that, that work continues to be brisk in town. Mm -hmm. Lots of new uh, housing starts going on. And uh, the more up-to-date we can keep that information, the better we're all going to be. And then if you wanted more information, there's some under tab nine. It's exhibits 1A and 2. 1A. Just 1A, mm -hmm. which talks about the, uh, the position or the request for the additional position. The, uh, the last item in finance overall has to do with the under property. We are uh, working to budget it's a thousand dollar increase, but it's you know shows a forty four percent increase, but uh, has to do with doing some ergonomic desk resizing for uh, two of the staff upstairs, one from purchasing, and uh, one for the accounter accountant. Excuse me. Do you want to jump into your divisions, or you kind of? I'm content. I mean, I, I just my concern was contracted services. That's been addressed. I don't have any questions in expenditure sides. I don't. I, I do want to ask. <clears throat> something's setting off the microphones. I don't know if you guys can hear it. There's Ooh. like a there's an echoing. Oh, I'm sorry. It, I can't. It, it overrides you. It could be the fact that we've got three here. Yeah. <laughs> you hear it? Hello. Yeah. You hear that? Yeah. Okay. Sure. I don't know what it is. You sure it's not aliens? I know. <laughs> <laughs> so it's two people in my head. <laughs> Don't do it. Yes, you can. <laughs> so uh, just so that we're clear, in the assessing department, uh, you had a part-time person, 16 hours a week, roughly. And will that remain the same? Yes. That's, that's what the... Uh, dollar amount is based on. Okay, and the proposed field appraiser position, is that or that's, that's is that new? That's, that's no longer uh, that's, part of it. That's essentially, that's the full-time position they had requested. That's essentially the functions that we're short on and have a deficit, so it's much of those duties we were proposing to uh, address through contracted services. And Good. Okay. I think Dave mentioned, Thanks. but I'll, I'll just reiterate, We've been able to fund that position uh, using full-time monies. As Dave said, we've uh, had inconsistency with uh, the chief assessor, and so there have been adequate resources to, to be able to fund this, and it's really been essential to bridge this gap. Mm -hmm. And we've really found that uh, the sort of work she's doing in the field is invaluable, and uh, really think it's important that we continue. Mm -hmm. 
Good. Is any of the um, revaluation, none of those costs are showing up in any of these department costs because they're one times, right? Right. right. We'll talk about that in okay. capital projects. Yep. Okay. 415. Yep. Okay. 415,000. Capital projects. Let's capital go get us. Under tab six, page four. Four. Two. All right. Two. Two, Two or four? Two. Oh, yeah. The narrative is. The narrative is on page four, sorry. Yeah. And we are anticipating that to be an appropriated item. This would cover the residential, residential side. side of things. Yeah, this council is certainly familiar with the fact that we have a commercial industrial uh, evaluation under ways we speak. And I think everyone agreed it's imperative that we move as swiftly as possible to have the residential piece uh, take place. And so uh, here it is. And as Ruth mentioned, um, we have programmed it in for appropriation. So this is affecting our bottom line. Uh, there are other options we can consider if you like, but this is at least a starting point for the conversation. Can I interject here? Uh, in, in relation to this, uh, I've done some studies, sales studies. Uh, I, I looked at uh, mid-2016 to mid-2017, and then I looked at 20, July 2017 to the current. Uh, and just to give you some numbers on the ratios, mm -hmm. uh, commercial, uh, it's gone from 79% down to 68%. Uh, condos from 85% down to 80%. Residential from 85% to 82%. And waterfront from 92% to 83%. Those are the ratios, meaning... Really? Meaning the assessments as compared to the sale prices. Yeah. In, in that Not surprised. roughly one-year period. One, one year period, yeah. uh, that shows substantial appreciation of values. Yes. And, and could you could you um, reiterate again what those triggers are of best practice to, to reevaluate and then I guess maybe statutory where it says you must? Well, statutorily, if the rates drop below 70 percent or okay. above 110 percent, uh, we're required to do a revaluation. Also, uh, we're supposed to do a revaluation and or every 10 years, okay. and it's been over 10 years. So we'll hit that 10-year trigger first before we hit the, the value. Oh, we've already hit it. We have, okay. Yeah. It's worth noting that uh, you know, the ratios that Dave just refers to is simply looking at the bottom line sales mm -hmm. as, opposed, as compared to the bottom line assessment number. Mm -hmm. uh, what we know for certain is that the building blocks, the components that come up with our assessed value are out of whack. Our land schedules, for instance, are severely uh, in need of attention, and so uh, there's factoring and other uh, ways of, of arriving at that final number, but we know for a fact that the internal workings of how values are created really need a lot of attention, and that's a lot of the work that we'll benefit from. Will that software address those some of those concerns? Well, the software uh, is basically the holding tank, if you will, of all the data. And it, does, it does have some analytical capabilities behind the scenes, I believe. Yeah, the, the cost schedules in the, in the uh, software program are based on uh, market-derived uh, numbers, mm -hmm. uh, mainly uh, Marshall and Swift cost uh, estimates, which is the national uh, cost service. Okay. And you're, <coughs> and you're proposing we just expense this item? Yes, and it's worth noting, um, perhaps many listening or in the audience will recall, uh, we, w we went to the voters and asked their approval uh, four years ago and were fairly soundly defeated. Uh, the reason we went there is that the requirement in your charter is that any indebtedness or bonding over $400,000, which this is, requires voter approval. So by, by going this route, uh, you do not need voter approval. Uh, but it does have a, a very direct impact on your bottom line and, and is putting upward pressure on your tax rate this year. So this appropriation number is baked into your calculations yes. of final tax rate yes. as it stands now? Yes. Okay. So uh, obviously between the uh, bond increased bond expenses in this item, they account for two large chunks of sure. your two, your increased 
uh, spending. Yeah, that's about 1.1 million if you look at those two expenses alone. Uh, mm -hmm. So that accounts, for th those are really the big drivers on the, res on the town side of the budget. Now, the other option would be to finance this. I would, if, uh, I think you can do that. I, if we do, it would be a two or three year finance at most, in my opinion. It wouldn't be certainly a 10 year. That would be foolhardy. Uh, that may require, uh, that would, re depending on the method of finance, uh, that would require putting it out to the voters. That's an option. Um, I would just caution that it puts us a year back if, should we be unsuccessful? And I, if we do that, we would certainly want to do a, a more direct education campaign. We really didn't do much last time, and I guess we shouldn't be surprised with the result necessarily. But um, if if we if we bonded it uh, and it was successful at a referendum vote in November, the process of doing the assessment, or the the appraisal of the residential property, would take us through past August of 2019. Yeah, it's not likely that we would have that work done in time for the follow the next year's commitment. So the consequence of that mm -hmm. is that oh. you would not have it next year. Right. That's it would be in the subsequent year. The estimate I was given was if they start after commitment this year, uh, they would get it done um, probably by summer of next year. Because you're talking about 9,000 mm -hmm. parcels. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so if it's, you know, 11 month project and it were bonded and subject to a referendum in November, then you're talking about November of 2020. 2020 right. so, so, I guess from a financial standpoint, what's the cost of bonding this? Do we have a, a rough idea of what we could expect? Um, we could certainly do an amortization on that. Um, it would be fairly minimal impact on FY19, mm -hmm. um, just given the amount and, and just the timing of when that indebtedness would occur and payments, first payments are required. Mm -hmm. There would probably be an interest payment in the, in the fall of 19. Right, probably be like 120 plus, or more than that actually, 130, 140 times plus the interest okay. if we did it for three years. What do you mean 140 times? 140 percent? No, one hundred and forty thousand dollars would be the principal, roughly plus interest per year. Per year. Okay. Yeah. If we, if we finance it over three years, three you're taking years. big chunks at all. Plus your fees. You're going to add probably three percent of just, just fee, just fees for financing alone. So mm -hmm. I don't think that it's worth bonding. Yeah. I, I just want to have that. I mean, I'm just trying to tease that out as to the, the pros and cons of doing it yep. either way. I mean, I think a one-time a one-time appropriation out of fund balance is probably appropriate. I mean, that's. Well, it's actually not even out of fund balance. No, it's, it's no. Of, it's, we're going to raise it. Yeah, no, we're going to raise it. Right. I think one could argue that you could actually finance it maybe up to no more than 10 years because that's the useful life of the entire valuation process or the entire valuation, but that's a stretch. And it, yeah, it's, 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 it's a stretch. I don't know yeah. if I would. I would do, do you end up, if you had a two year finance, would you end up with the kind of expenses? Because it sounds like for short two or three year financing. Uh, if you were going to incur a three percent charge, I mean that's like points. I mean it's so sh it's 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 upfront right off the bat. And who does that for two or three year financing? Is that is that about right as far as? What? Well, we'd have to pay the fees, the cost of issuance right. on that anyway, plus whatever mm -hmm. the interest would be for uh, the two two or three years. More than likely, we'll be doing other borrowing, so it'd be wrapped into a to bigger borrowing. So the closing costs we could allocate it, but it, it would be part of a larger issue, I suspect. Right. So uh, essentially, right. if you do it over two years, it would be about half the impact. Instead of 415, mm -hmm. it's slightly but more even, than half. But even if you split yeah. it between two, because I mean, the timeline sounded like that, you know, you could put a portion of this into next year's budget because it would be paid after June 31st. For, we could do some this year, and right? some, uh, in 19, yeah. and some in 2000. I mean, you'd have to prorate it. Well, they, yeah. I'd it's assume not substantial you'd, enough, maybe, to do that. Yeah. I'd assume you'd pay it, and we'd pay ourselves back with the bond proceeds, right? No, I'm talking about even just from a funding. You only fund it, the way that they uh, offer this. You fund what you're actually going to pay in this budget cycle, um, and then fund mm -hmm. the remaining portion in the next budget cycle. The only problem with that is it will be difficult to sign a contract right. yeah, I, right. without I the confidence that I have the second half of funding committed. Yeah. That's the challenge. Yeah. So, okay. I actually have a question. So the 415, 
Um, so there's going to have to be some education around this no matter what because people need to understand the impact that when they get contacted to schedule a showing of their uh, property, if they don't, there's some risks that are entailed in a revaluation. Is that it built into the 415? Is it built into the other budget? And how much are you looking at for that type of educational campaign around the issue? Yeah, they price these based on uh, based on a per parcel cost, and they bake into that number uh, a level of public education. We okay. may choose to do things over and above, but yeah. these firms, this is all they do. So they they really do know how to uh, um, put together a PR yeah. campaign. I mean, I've heard, I've heard, which is good because I think the more education, the better we will be in the end. Because I've heard mm -hmm. some absolutely horror stories about other communities and what can happen. <coughs> Um, because they'll just assess it based on what they think is inside versus what is actually inside, and then it could be just skyrocketed. Yeah, this demands uh, very detailed outreach. You know, we're touching every single resident right. taxpayer in town. Literally. So uh, I, I, think, yeah, I think perhaps moving forward, we, we flag this as an area to revisit if we get to a point where we're looking at final budget adjustments, and then we can determine maybe the best way to proceed if we're, if we're looking at ways to good place to leave it. Ways to, to, to approach. Um, I'm comfortable right now with it in appropriations, um, yeah. but if we do have to go back and revisit that at, at the end of this process, Agreed. it's at least there, and we can we can flag that for an area of discussion. Agreed, and that's what staff we, we yeah. appreciate how it's postured right because now. Because yeah, I'd like to know but, more about yeah. this allocable cost of uh, the issuance and the interest, mm -hmm. uh, because. Uh, I, I don't want to do something that's just wasteful, but I would like to know. Uh, uh, we've traditionally uh, offered these up for referendum, so. Well, actually, I, that, that's the first year we've ever done a referendum. The one we've in 2013. Them. We've always appropriated yeah. them within the yeah. assessor budget. Can I make yeah. two, two comments. Number one, uh, that was that 415 was an estimate that was thrown out. Uh, when someone asked uh, KRT for a rough estimate, and it was based on, I think it was based on a 9,000 parcel mm -hmm. uh, estimate. Um, it may be less than 9,000, uh, which could bring that down below 400,000. Mm -hmm. And the other part is um, we're in, in the process of, of converting to vision, and all of the commercial property information will, will be live in the vision program. The residential will not. It will be carried over from TRIO into vision and it will be locked in there. And any changes we make to the residential properties or for example, new, new construction will have to be entered into TRIO and then the final numbers put into the vision program. So if this so if this gets delayed two years, that will be the process for the next two years, mm -hmm. which means we, we will have to keep TRIO. Okay. Right. I was just going to ask, that's just a one-time transfer, though, right? Once it's transferred in division, then you're going to be using that one software and keep updating that on a regular Yes. We don't have to run parallel Right. Systems. Once everything okay. is in vision yeah. uh, live, okay. uh, then we can get rid of TRIO. Mm -hmm. And that means keeping both. For so however pay, long we take. Pay, right. Paying for those software licensing fees. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, other, bake, other, that, bake that into the, I mean, you know, flag that in as, as a cost of, of just, of, you know, doing that process as well. I mean, that's a valid point. I, you know, I just want to weigh, uh, you know, the cost of paying for it up front versus financing. And then <laughs> the other issue to me is more political than anything else. But other questions for finance assessment? Okay. Nope. Good, thank you. Great. First budget, David. Yep. Nice job. <laughs> Unscathed. Old school. He's yeah. like, yeah, it is what it I is. Wish Todd, I wish Todd could say the same. I know it, I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Ran him through the ring of production. Uh, next, uh, uh, Planning Department. Uh, planning Director Jay Chase. Welcome to the jungle. Oh, another new guy. It can't be my computer, it's not transmitting. We're picking up Mike Reaver. I wonder if it's just the sheer number of microphones we have on the table. <laughs> they did say it was a bit of an experiment today. Really? It seems to be happening a lot lately. <laughs> Experimentation. <laughs> Jay, where would you like to start? Uh, first, by thanking you for uh, letting me uh, present the Planning, Code, and Technical Division uh, budget. 
Um, I have a sort of a brief overview, um, but if you'd like. Um, Thank you. So, as I just said, I'm pleased to present to the committee a budget from our planning, code, and technical division department, um, starting at 2.39% uh, increase. Um, like uh, much of uh, the town's budget, a lot of this of our department is driven by uh, wage and benefit increases. Um, however, I'm pleased to announce that a lot of this is supported by uh, revenue increases of 11.2%. Um, that means we're seeing a lot of building permits, plumbing permits, electric permits, and the like coming through our department. Um, and so that's exciting. Um, but it also, so uh, just a couple other things I wanted to note with regard to staffing. Um, in our department, uh, I referenced uh, not only the code and planning divisions, which I'm sure you're familiar with, but we're also creating uh, as part of uh, this year a technical division um, within our department. And this is really a, a budget neutral item, but one I want to bring to your attention as part of this process. And uh, the, the technical division is going to be led by our town engineer, Angela Blanchett. Um, and it's going to include our sustainability coordinator and GIS coordinator. Um, so the purpose uh, for creating this division is to ensure that uh, the technical abilities that these three uh, individuals and positions, really, uh, but we are fortunate to have three very capable individuals, uh, bring uh, to bear are shared across the departments. Um, and so we, in talking with the town manager, felt that the organization in the planning, code, and technical uh, department was really the uh, uh, best approach. As I mentioned, this is budget neutral. The three positions are already existing in, in the town. Um, and so other than the typical increase in wage and benefits that you would see regardless, um, it's, it's neutral to the town's bottom line. However, to our department's bottom line, it does add a substantial increase um, because the position has been supported um, by really by planning, public works, and administrative departments. Community services also um, supports part of the position through beach revenues for the piping plover components. As part of this budget, we're proposing to fold the uh, take in the, what was in administrative and public works and fold those into planning. So those really do sort of drive our numbers up. And um, without, without sort of that realignment, our 2.39% increase would actually probably come in at around a 10 or 11% decrease in our overall budget. And again, that's largely being driven by those 11.2% revenue increases that we're seeing. So that, um, though that's not a budget driver, certainly some, well, I guess it is <laughs> to, to my department, but understanding the overall picture is uh, critical here. Um, another item I just wanted to touch on has to do with inspection services. Um, back in FY14, the um, planning and fire department worked together uh, in a collaborative effort to bring forward the creation of a commercial code officer slash fire inspection position. Um, this was uh, really a good time based on sort of uh, staffing at, at that time, some turnover that was occurring in both departments to create this um, position. And it's been a shared service between our two departments that has sat uh, in the planning department uh, for the last four uh, fiscal years, and it's really was the idea of creating a position was to create more effective and efficient reviews of commercial um, inspections, plan reviews, sort of the pre-development meetings, and it's been largely successful. I think both departments have been very pleased with it, um, as have we heard um, from folks who are on the development side that it's been very effective. However, as I noted, uh, so the, the, there's been increased development trends, which are represented by those increased revenues. Um, and those increases have really put additional demands on, on those services that are requested. So together with the fire department, we're looking at sort of overall staffing. And though our department isn't proposing any increase sort of in the code <coughs> inspector, um, we're proposing to maintain three uh, code, uh, code inspectors. The fire department does have uh, an additional position that's being demonstrated, um, but again, it's all part of a collaborative effort. And, and uh, again, I just wanted to sort of make note of that, that we're very supportive of that. And though it doesn't necessarily appear in our budget, it is certainly something that um, 
I feel we are supporting. Uh, so that was really my overview, and I'm happy to sort of dive into the detailed questions I'm sure you may have. Questions? Uh, Chris. Just uh, so the first one, I just want to make sure this is probably more of a general question. Um, so I understood wages and benefits. You're picking up the sustainability coordinator in your department. Yep. Were we seeing a corresponding decrease in the other covered departments? I know yes. not necessarily broken out, but you saw was... it in the executive line and okay. uh, also in public works. Okay. So uh, Jay's bearing the full expense of that sustainability coordinator position. And and the uh, actually community services would be doing much, much better because that was coming out of beach revenues. Now that's still going back into the general fund. There is money that does follow from uh, for the for the uh, plover coordinator piece. Yeah. Uh, yeah. 12500 I think, okay. supports those efforts. Okay. Other than that, um, Jay's assuming the entire cost of the position. Okay. Um, and then just one of this is more of a process question. Mm -hmm. uh, I noticed boards and committees are under this department. Mm -hmm. um, is there any reason, sp specific reason for that? I would have thought that might have been more under executive or something. Well, it's really planning uh, yeah. board and zoning board only. Okay, it's and not and conservation commission, and I conservation. think, as well. Um, okay. It's really those three, and we can break that out better in future years to make that. Well, no, it's broken out fine. It's just, it, yeah, it's all broken out. I just, yeah. I, I, it just struck me the list of committees, and it sounds like that's more of an all encompassing thing than, than versus planning. But if that's where the bulk costs are, then mm -hmm. but that's fine. Good. Good. I just have, if you can refresh my memory. Sure. Under a con for the boards and committees under contract services, is that a contract expense for internal um, expenses or is that um, external third party planning issues? Uh, I'm just trying to be sure. I'm just trying to remember what. Right Page 34. Yep. So that um, is largely. Um, Attorneys. What's that? Is it like attorneys? Uh, nope. It's largely for um, what we call our planning initiatives line. And actually, there's an exhibit which we talk about. And that's to support sort of the sort of catch-all things that come up throughout the year. Any zoning initiatives um, with the updated uh, comprehensive plan. We'll be certainly doing oh, okay. a lot of efforts in that regards. Um, so sort of supporting those type of efforts that are... Yeah, that's, that's we found an exhibit. This is tab 9, exhibit 3B gives you a list of four different items. Comprehensive plan implementation, FEMA flood maps. We expect uh, that coming forward this year. Oh, yeah. uh, some early engineering regarding some Route 1 improvements. And then as part of the comprehensive plan, we have a return on investment tool that we're really excited about. We anticipate the need for some additional consulting help as we kind of understand that better and modify it to our liking. Um, Mm -hmm. So as I noted sort of last year, just for, you know, these, this is sort of a, a catch-all of things yeah. that staff sees coming, but certainly we understand priorities change. But last year, um, the funding were used for campus master planning, um, the Higgins Beach rezoning effort, okay. to give you a taste of the type of things mm -hmm. that are discussed. One type of bottom of the We I circled that earlier 13, this yeah. afternoon as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Good. Uh, capital budget? Or oh, TPO? Sure. Uh, there are no uh, capital equipment, so capital projects, tab 7, pages 4 and 5. So we have four items that we're proposing for this year. Uh, the first one is a renovation to the, sort of really the front front of the house, so to speak, in the planning and code office. Um, for those who have been into the area recently, uh, given the amount of uh, traffic that we see, we really see this effort um, around customizing or, or providing a better customer experience and more efficiencies in our, um, our services. Uh, when, the, when the department was originally uh, design, so to speak. There were four, four full-time staff. We now have nine full-time staff. Um, and really, it's the front office that's the most cramped. We have two ad admins uh, who sit at the front and do a, a great job of supporting the over 5,000 calls that come into the front office, the countless uh, pop-ins, uh, people looking for different permits or asking questions. Um, and it's difficult to um, at the front desk to be able to service more than one customer at a time. Just if one person's on the phone and someone walks in, you're sort of having to talk over. 
other elements that uh, we see this renovation be able to do. When folks want to review a file or particularly a plan set, something's going before the Board of Appeals or Planning Board, there's very limited space to be able to unfold those mm -hmm. without sort of being in other people's laps. Mm -hmm. um, so this is an item that has been on our department's radar for, I think this is the fourth year that it's being proposed. I think three years ago it made it this far in the process i think the last couple of years it fell off even earlier <laughs> um and so um, no guarantees but progress <laughs> that's <laughs> and i i permitted it this year just so jay could have uh, the experience <laughs> <laughs> of success yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the experience of success so. i'm not I'm gonna judge what that might be yeah. just the experience <laughs> so um so that is that item, and I'm happy to sort of walk through all four, answer questions, however, whatever the best approach is. Just for reiteration, um, a, a, I, and B? Yes. Define those again, please. I is impact fee, so in this case, they're both traffic impact fee accounts. Uh, as an aside, we uh, have uh, five or six different impact fee areas in town, all have different uh, varying amounts. We uh, allocate or reserve those monies, and they can all be used within that area. And so these are two projects uh, for which there's funding that we'd like to advance. And, and there is enough in, in both of those accounts to cover that. That's, that's, we don't need any yes, additional funding. Yes, you'll see funding. in the latter years there actually will be some construction related to these, okay. and uh, we do expect to be able to fund those with impact fees as well. Okay. Okay. A, we're expensing it. That's appropriation. Yes. Pro it's appropriation. Yep. 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 And then B is bonding, obviously. Yep. Um, why would we be bonding the the watershed management implementation? Well, I think it's a candidate. It's a candidate that's I think eligible for financing. Uh, it's physical construction, so I, I think it kind of meets all of those criteria, and it's of, a, of an amount that. Uh, okay, so that's not a study or anything. That's actual physical work being done. I, I see management impl implementation. Phase one. Phase so one. Yeah. Yep. So, so this last year. Uh, FY18, uh, we the Phillips Brook Watershed Management Plan was adopted, um, and so now we are in the implementation okay. phase. So this is really looking at sort of supporting funds through DEP grant funding sources that our town engineers currently pursuing, um, and that we have a based on early discussions with our um, friends at DEP, we have a we're pretty hopeful that we'll be successful. That you would get that through a grant. Um, that this would support Bonding. the overall effort. So, so okay. there's a number of items that are in here. One is a culvert replacement. Um, some other work is uh, about floodplain uh, restoration. So it's a it's a heavy lift, and this fifty thousand that is being requested is a, a portion of that. There's a lot of state funding that would hopefully. So a number of pieces have to fall into place yep. before the fifty thousand would actually get spent. Yeah, this is really yeah, yeah. considerably match money. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the sort of okay. projects that he just described are far more costly than the fifty thousand. So we'll Good. need to secure other other monies. Mm -hmm. So one thing I don't so see in this is the close the gap project. I know we're we're responsible for that. I assume it's going to come out of the technical department on your end, correct? Well, well I I find it says. No, I, well, I know, I know that, but I'm just saying that I don't know if there's additional. There is staffing support, so yeah. um, so community services actually taking the lead on that. However, okay. our department and Angela, uh, town engineer, have been very, um, very much involved. Um, but the funding for that, as is already stated, has already been sort of appropriated. Sort of Committed so. by the state, right? And well, uh, various sources. Yeah. Lots um, of sources. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. an interesting and, point. I suppose we could have identified as a capital project. Um, we haven't. I suppose we could if you wished, but there's a variety of funding sources. Mm -hmm. um, the town has committed monies through its capital budget uh, five years ago or so, so there's no additional funding request, but it's a project that the, uh, the town is overseeing and providing uh, staff support for that effort. I just want to make sure that that's captured from an, from an accounting standpoint, more of making sure that you know yeah. we have we have that. Yeah, you know. I believe at this at this point the the funds are in place to yep. to carry the, the project forward. We have we have lots of grand plans for our technical department. I just want to make sure they're <laughs> available to do other work as opposed to um, just managing projects. Yes, lots so, of priorities. That's right, that's right. So uh, just a, um, a refresher. I think it was four years ago, actually, Tom, not that that really meant, and it was $240,000 and it was actually not appropriated. It was actually approved for bonding, I, I believe. So it'll be part of, 
and so it's carried forward until you're actually bonded. It's just carried forward as part of his report of those things that we've approved and not funded, um, which get reviewed every year by the finance committee. And we've kept that on, knowing hopefully that they would. So yeah, my so, question wasn't yeah. wasn't really towards. I knew no, no, I, I knew just we wanted to put the public yeah. so that they know that it wasn't appropriate. It was actually approved for bonding, so it will be part of a future bond issuance. I just wanted to as, as the same comment that Council Chiazzo mentioned earlier regarding the reval. And, and the funding source is that this might be the office renovations while I support it um, because it is a construction item which is no different than the watershed management it might be something that could be included in a bonding rather than uh, through appropriations when push comes to shove in the end mm -hmm. certainly something you could I mean, it is a construction and it follows the same methodology of the same logic that was described around the management implementation mm -hmm. plan sure. other questions I'm good. Good. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, Thank you very much. See, it wasn't that painful. Yeah, it was such a great topic we're talking about. This is your first one, too, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. All the fresh, you know, fresh. It was faces. such a good. It was such a good initial Community presentation. Service. We had nothing to. We had nothing Community to talk about. Community services, assessing, planning. I should mention. And now we're uh, getting the old boys up here. <laughs> <laughs> Robert, you want to come up? Um, as they come up, I just wanted to mention, I did have a conversation with Councillor Hayes after last meeting, and you'll see on your agenda item seven, meeting recap, tentative adjustments. Yep. What I'd love to do, and he seemed to, to, to like the idea, is uh, if there's time at the end, if you can do a quick recap, just so we can have a running list of either We will do that. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, rather than holding everything in. Uh, for the final meeting right. and, and that should be a report out to the main council as right. well. what was the first item that we uh, Reval Reval was number one for 450 second and one was office renovations. office renovations for 25,000 good Chief, do you have some prepared comments at the, off the top? You want to jump right in? Thank you. I do Chief. not. Um, I want to jump right in. I'll, I'll uh, say thank you very much for, for having us here. Um, we always appreciate the opportunity to uh, to be here and to present. Um, I'm, I may have some remarks as we go along, but I, I'm more interested in what you uh, what you folks would like to know. You want to start with revenue like we usually do, or do you want to go? Yep. Yep. One thing I'll speak to on revenues, uh, the police department's the beneficiary of it, but um, uh, in the last two years, we have enhanced parking enforcement at Higgins Beach in particular. And uh, this year, we're proposing to cover those additional costs. There's some base level of reserve officer that we have uh, at all beach areas. But that additional cost, we're proposing to cover that with beach revenues. Mm -hmm. Um, there's also some parking revenues associated with uh, the new fee structure in place, and it would be ideal for those parking revenues with experience and time uh, to cover more and more of those expenses. So time will tell if, if that yeah, is able and to I, I mean, I've heard other counselors, not just myself, say that uh, when you have these kinds of recreational expenses, <clears throat> it is good to be able to have uh, substantially all of the costs borne by users as opposed to uh, the taxpayers who might not ever use some of the facilities. So I applaud that, that adjustment. Thank you, Chief. I also note uh, a couple of other things on revenues. There's a fairly large increase in um, sale of town property, and that's uh, in part with history, but also um, that would be uh, coupled with the CIP that we've put in for the motorcycles because that would be money coming back to us from the trade-in of the of the two motorcycles if that project moves forward. Um, obviously, if it, if it didn't, there'd be a reduction in that revenue line. So you're realizing the revenue on the trade-in here but expensing it on the capital side for, okay. Yeah. What are we, are, is that just an estimate of the of the trade-in value or do yes. we, are we comfortable with that? It's a fairly yeah. accurate number. Yeah. Okay. Estimate. Okay. Okay. And then there's a uh, another significant increase, and that's in the uh, Hida, federal Hida revenues. As you know, we're for the, the town is a fiduciary for, for the Hida program, and um, we've been negotiating with with uh, the folks for an increase in that 
And can, can you remind me again, is that just for issues within the town or is it countywide, statewide? How do those, how are those yeah, resources distributed? Yeah, let's explain for the public, I think, HIDA revenues, yeah. since it's a fairly substantial item as well as a substantial increase. Sure. Um, well, I, I'll tell you a little bit of the history if you if you have a minute to go through that. It's your time, Chief. Okay, all right. Well, um, years ago, and I don't remember exactly how many years ago now, uh, we had a case uh, that resulted in some uh, federal uh, sharing, the asset forfeiture sharing. And um, at that time, the, uh, the HIDA came forward, and, and I'll tell you what HIDA is in a minute, but they came forward and wanted to know if we wanted to assign an officer there. We'd been fighting for manpower on the street. I said, I really can't do it. There's no way to, uh, to justify. I've been asking for people, There's no way to justify that. So um, they came back two or three times and, and we met with, the, I believe it was town manager Owens at the time, and uh, gave us some assurance that that position uh, could be uh, possibly self-sustaining because of the forfeitures and so forth. And he agreed to it and we put a person on. And uh, within a few months of the person being on, they uh, came to me and said, geez, it's, it's, hard, uh, this, it, it's hard to do this work because um, our cell phones are being shut off, our um, lease cars are being repossessed. So I called the director to find out what the situation was. And, and um, at the time, they had the Connecticut State Police as acting as a fiduciary. Now the HIDER is a program, it's not an agency, and therefore they're required to have a fiduciary. So there are, it's run by, um, uh, it's overseen by an executive board. There are folks from DEA, um, there are folks from state and, and local agencies that are involved in this, and they all share in the assets and so forth. And um, so when I called to find out what was going on, uh, the what had happened is the colonel of the uh, Connecticut State Police, who was sitting on the board at the time, volunteered his agency to be the fiduciary. Well, the people actually doing the work really didn't want to be volunteered to be the fiduciary, and so things became very difficult. And so there was a lot of red tape, and bills weren't being paid, cell phones were being shut off, cars were being repossessed, <laughs> and so forth. And so I started to make some inquiry with him as to exactly what this being a fiduciary meant. And um, so he explained it, and I brought it back to the town manager and talked to him about it. And uh, we met with the, the uh, director at the time and uh, offered to be their fiduciary for a percentage of, uh, of what they pay out. So every dollar that they pay out, um, they, they get a grant every year. It's uh, over $3 million, and, and every uh, dollar that they pay out, we get a percentage of that for processing their their bills and so forth. And Ruth has been uh, great about having her people do that. And as a result, we realize this is revenue. So, what what kind of expenditure line do we see with that from an enforcement standpoint? Does this we still have a full time person out on the street that we're using or utilizing for this program? I assume, right? We do. Okay. And the the, uh, the the geographic reach is all over New England, is it not? Yes. So okay. uh, yep. much of their work, some of it does happen within yep. Scarborough, but much of it... Uh, it's more task force oriented, right, than somewhere as else. opposed to day-to-day -day patrol type stuff. Yes. Okay. Yeah. I think you probably uh, uh, saw some things recently where there was a, a fairly big situation in, in Turner uh, where there are a bunch of high-end vehicles, a lot of cash, property, buildings, that was all a, a HIDA operation, which mm. we will ultimately share. Good. So this, this revenue stream is more, it's more administratively processed. It's not based on the number of forfeitures or assets seized in the course Correct. of a year. Is Correct. that a separate, that's a separate account, separate issue type? Yeah, yes. we okay. don't count on that. This is a yep. contractual piece that okay. we have confidence in. Okay. And that, that percentage increase is just, it's based on the new contract, I assume, or is there increased workload? Um, it's, incre it's based on the fact that we've been doing a really good job for them for a number of years, and, and uh, we felt it was time to, to address that. Okay. Nicely done. Yeah, very well done. <laughs> good. Other questions on uh, the revenue side? Nope. Expenses. Tab 4. Yeah, tab 4 starting at page uh, 61. Okay. 
Uh, so you have about two two percent uh, 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 increase in expenses year over year. Correct. Two point one. Not much to talk about there. Yeah, I, I just have a couple questions. They're kind of recurrent from from year to year, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. Operation Hope, obviously, that's that's mm -hmm. going strong. Unfortunately, yeah. um, are we are we seeing increased demand? Are we seeing it leveling off? Are we seeing uh, other groups step up and share some of those requirements? Or what, can you give us kind of an update or a status on that? Sure. Um, we have seen some other groups step up in different parts of the state, uh, trying to trying to coordinate. We have seen uh, a lot of bills coming before the legislature to try to uh, to get increased um, uh, treatment and detox capability here in Maine. Um, it, it's interesting when you ask, has it? Certainly, we're not seeing what we did. In the very beginning, where we, you know, on a Monday morning, we might have nine people lined up at the door, uh, but for instance, today, uh, we saw three people. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's steady. There's a bit of an ebb and flow to it. Um, I'm, I'm working to try to, as a matter of fact, we're, I'm working with Project Grace, and um, we're working to put together a small, and we want to keep it fairly small, advisory committee. Uh, folks like Dr. Kirsch and, and a couple other folks that uh, have agreed to, to come on board and help us out. And what we're trying to do with that is to understand and try to develop a model for how we go forward from here because what we're doing is not the answer. Uh, there needs to be a much more comprehensive uh, state program to make this really work. And uh, the, the dilemma is, is that I don't want to slam the door in somebody's face when they need help, and yet this isn't the answer. So we're trying to understand how do we move this into a more comprehensive program. Is it, is it fair to say that the, the need is fairly consistent still? I mean, we, we may have seen that initial push because yeah. it was a unique program, and now we're kind of seeing that consistency? Unfortunately, it is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Just okay. A, can you refresh my memory about the whole... Um, I know there's some restrictions about fees that you can't charge. Can you charge fees through the insurance company? Can you collect any revenue at all um, as part of the program? Through Operation Hope? Yes. Well, the dilemma is, honestly, is that um, the majority of the people that we see have no insurance mm -hmm. and no means of paying. Uh, oftentimes what we're seeing is, is, you know, people, by the time they get to us, they're broken, really broken people who have, uh, who often have no job, have no uh, income, have no, uh, you know, means. They generally are at a place where they've uh, estranged themselves from their families. They're, uh, they're, they're really broken people by the time they get to us. So, no, there really isn't any ability to, to tap into insurance, um, sadly. What, what state agencies are you working with? Is it a DHHS thing? Is it state police? Is it all of the above? Or is it anybody that's will, is willing to listen kind of thing? Yeah, that's about it. Anybody that's willing to listen. <laughs> right, yeah. right, right. So there's no yeah. real coordinated effort on the state side to try and We're organize treatment, you know, treatment or enforcement and coordinating everything together? There is some legislation, like I said. That yeah, yeah. I, I think the problem is, is that what we really need is treatment. Mm -hmm. And what we have is a lousy business model. Nobody wants to come set up a treatment center in a place where 80% of the people that are going to come through the door have no insurance and no means of paying. Okay. About how many a year in the past year did you assist? Um, 70. I see it. And how many so far? Do you know? Uh, over 300. It's 300 and... Oh, yeah. Way over. Uh, yeah. And I don't know if... Um, town manager mentioned that there there are uh, there are class action lawsuits being brought against opioid uh, uh, manufacturers uh, based on uh, inappropriate false advertising, uh, and that there are communities like Portland, like Lewiston, uh, Waterville, that are joining in these efforts to seek reimbursement for the costs like we're incurring, and I didn't know if you had a, a view. The, I've heard some interest on the part of 
council members to uh, explore that further. I offer that to you, whether that would be something that you might consider appropriate. I certainly would like to explore it. Um, we're, we're exploring a bunch of different things right now. We've, uh, we've uh, reached out to a number of different grant opportunities and so forth. The, uh, um, as, as I think I've reported before, the Attorney General was very kind to us with a donation of $50,000 that came from settlement funds. Uh, mm -hmm. I think those were tobacco settlement funds, but mm -hmm. still. Um, and uh, so we're, we're looking at a number of different things, and I, I'd be happy to explore more of that. Uh, Good. I think that we'll, class action suit. We'll, 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 we'll take that up as a, probably as a workshop to educate all of us as to uh, what kind of legal representation is out there. And, and good. Thank you. Sure. Uh, Other questions? Yeah. And we, we've talked about this in the past, too, about several, um, uh, a specific group of businesses in town, let's say, that are using a disproportional amount of resources. Mm -hmm. Have we been able to make any progress at all in being able to address those? Um, no. Okay. Not to this point. Okay. What can we do from a from a council standpoint to maybe move that along or explore those options? Yeah, we've uh, we've looked at what other national models uh, essentially would be an impact fee. Mm -hmm. um, we've lost the opportunity. The impact fee really needs to be assessed at the time of approval and mm -hmm. documented as such. So kind of the, the existing challenges we have, I think we have to live with. Okay. Um, and frankly, I don't, and, and really you're referring to uh, large scale retail operations. Right. Uh, the economy's really changed such that we don't see that that's really a, a viable model necessarily going forward. So the likelihood mm -hmm. of us getting other large scale retail is uh, probably minimal at this point. So we've not, not really pursued it much more than... Is there any kind of creative policing maybe that we could do? I mean, we talked about maybe like a kiosk or some something there or some kind of deterrent. I know that's not... We don't necessarily want to get into security for individual companies, but if it's, a, if it's consuming a large portion of resources, maybe it is in our best interest to be a little more proactive. And I don't know. I don't want to... I'm not suggesting sure. you do your job. I'm just saying... You know, uh, you know. I, I think it's something we want to try and look at, and if we can, if we can find a way to be part of that solution, I think that'd be very helpful for us. We've explored a number of options. The difficulty becomes that, um, you know, it really needs to be a response by somebody who has arrest powers mm -hmm. when they when mm -hmm. they call, because generally they are detaining somebody that mm -hmm. ultimately needs to be charged or arrested. Um, so, you know, we talked about could we use uh, you know, VIPs or something along those lines or something different. And I think there are efficiencies that probably could be had in terms of follow-up going back and picking up reports and things like that. But in terms of the actual response, unfortunately, there's no real way around that. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing. Look at the any police log in the weekly paper. Yeah. Anything with a essentially with a Gallery Boulevard address, and I'm not branding it, but that's where this concentration of retail establishments are, um, mm -hmm. is, is really the, what you're talking about. So um, over, I, I gotta tell you, overall, this is a great budget, because if you look at the net increase on a six and a half million dollar budget, um, your net increase after increase in revenues is less than one fifth of 1%, so it's pretty darn good. Um, the question I have is actually more forward looking, Mm -hmm. And what that is is, you know, with the new building, you know, um, which, you know, this is great stabilization. What happens when we get our new building? And <coughs> have we started looking at, because, I mean, this is one of the largest, outside of the school department, this is the largest budget on public safety And when I combine the two together. Sure. Have we looked at those costs? Have we done anything yet to understand what the impact of that new facility is going to be for future budgets? Do we know anything? I mean, I mean... It, it, off the top of my head, certainly there are going to be things like uh, our custodian isn't going to be able to, you know, manage that facility mm -hmm. like like he does now. Uh, so we're probably going to need to either look at part-time help or a second uh, custodian mm -hmm. or something of that sort. Um, in terms of the maintenance costs and so forth, that's uh, that's a little difficult to predict right at this right at this point mm -hmm. in time. It's, it's twice the square footage, so you can expect right. kind of utility expenses, all of those. Mm -hmm. In terms of staffing, is that what you're really going to kind well, of Well, I mean, look? yeah, kind of, you know, it's, 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 it's everything. It's, you know. 
Public safety is, is really determined in much in, in large part um, so many officers or fire officials per thousand, um, and a community like Scarborough that continues to grow, uh, we can expect that the the demand will rise commensurately. So we've we've been kind of shelving those staffing plans for far too long, mm -hmm. and yeah. that's going to catch up with us. It's not necessarily. Uh, uh, predicated by the new building per se, but as we continue to grow, demands grow with it. And, and I know we, we were able to add, I think, a, at least I think one or two officers. I think over the last year or right. two, mm -hmm. um, where you know where are we in the staffing plan? I know that wasn't where we needed to be, um, right? But um, maybe can you give an update of where we should be? And we're always I think we're always going to be playing catch up at this point. Sure. But, um, you know, when it reaches critical mass, obviously we want to try and deal with it before we get to that point. Sure. Um, ultimately, um, you know, at this point in time, and, and honestly, I didn't bring any staffing plan uh, to yep. you this year because yep. I just didn't feel like it was an appropriate time to do it and, and yep. with the new facility and Understood. so forth. Uh, yep. no, I appreciate that. Yeah. So, but that doesn't mean the need has gone any place. Um, ultimately, what I'd like to be able to do is, and it would take about three more people, is to staff uh, staff another area so that we could try to ensure that we had four officers and a sergeant on every shift. Uh, and one of the big reasons for that is the Gallery Boulevard area and so forth that we've tried over years to try to get to that point where we could uh, keep somebody right in that area. And it's and so far other priorities and so forth and staffing issues have not allowed us to completely do that. And so mm -hmm. that's one consideration. I think uh, another consideration is that I think we're at a point where we really need to uh, think seriously about a dispatch coordinator. We currently have a, uh, a sergeant, Steve Thibodeau, who's with us tonight, and he does a great job. But it's a, uh, um, it's a part-time responsibility for him and I think we're at the point particularly where we're servicing Old Orchard and we're doing the peace sapping for Buxton and so forth and particularly now where it's getting more complicated uh, we've we've had emergency medical dispatching for some time now the emergency fire dispatching has been mandated by the state and has just uh, just been mandated and uh, those issues uh, become more complicated, and training becomes more essential. And there's a whole yeah, but you'll get you'll get state funding to cover oh, that. Oh, absolutely, right? yeah. absolutely. They wouldn't <laughs> yeah. they wouldn't give us an unfunded mandate. No, you know better than that. Of course so, not. So, right. yeah. yeah. So um, I really think that we're at the point where we need to consider a full time uh, coordinator position that can can really uh, have that be their primary focus. So those are a couple of the things that I think we need to consider. And again, I haven't brought those forward, but they're certainly yep, things that yep. are on the horizon. Uh, yeah, no, on the horizon. It's, yeah, it's more of a more of a acknowledgement that it hasn't gone away just because we're not seeing it this year. Absolutely. Sure. Okay. Ready for capital? Yes. Before we move to that, I was waiting to see if Chief would uh, confess a bit. Um, uh -oh. His budget looks really good in part because some of the expense that will ultimately be police uh, is actually in the executive line. I think we covered that before. Police contract is up for negotiation this spring, and so we have resources, financial resources, in the executive line um, for the fir year, first year settlement. We don't know those details yet, so um, part of why he looks so good is that I'm carrying some of his money. Good. Yeah. You, wow, he you, just told you totally threw him under yeah, the bus. That was right a, yeah. <laughs> wow, he looked way down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Now, having Tom. said that, yeah. <laughs> you know, Tom, you know, Tom moved a little bit further away from the chief. Yeah. <laughs> having said that, I will tell you that I was the one that brought that to his attention when he was uh, <laughs> when he was telling me how good my budget looked. I said, don't forget. <laughs> uh, Capital. And I didn't catch that, so that's... So well, we'll catch it in appointments. <laughs> yeah. So capital, uh, capital equipment, tab 6, page 7. And there's no project, so let's just go to tab 6, page 7. So there's four programs, four for this year? Four for this year. I'm just having year. trouble finding page 6. Yeah, there's no some paper. Okay. Upper left corner. Upper yeah. left. Yeah. Community oh, services. Yeah. No, page seven. Right here. Seven. Oh yes, yes. Thank you. I think you made the print so small that we couldn't read it. <laughs> <laughs> Staggeringly small. 
so the first one we have is a taser uh, replacement program and we're requesting funds to replace eight of our uh, tasers that are five years old and reached their warranty expiration um, these are electrical devices and they begin to experience repair problems and so forth and uh, they have been a necessary tool for us they've been uh, um, used in situations that have uh, allowed us to handle situations with nobody getting hurt and without having to uh, wrestle with people and, uh, and so forth. So uh, they have been a good tool. I, I think they're something that we need to continue to invest in to, to make sure that we have that available to us. What do you do with the uh, uh, ones that are being replaced? They, they, go back to the, they go back to the factory. Is this a net? Yes. Net figure? <coughs> Thank you. Are there any um, any other, I guess, maybe lack of a better word, non-lethal um, types of equipment that we're using, or is it some, is it just simply taser using bean bags or other types of devices? We do we do have some other capabilities, um, bean bag being one of them. We have uh, OC spray mm -hmm. is another. Mm -hmm. um, the batons. Yep. Is there, is there batons. is there any um, any rationale b b behind going with one sole purpose, like all tasers or all beamers, or are they all situational depending on what's going on at the particular scene at the particular time? Yeah, they are pretty situational. Okay. And, um, you know, e each one of them is simply another tool that the officer has uh, on, their t on their belt. And are those swapped out from shift to shift? Are they, they are not. Are they carried in the vehicles? They're on the officer's belt. On the belt. On the belt. Yep. So, like the service weapon, they're issued. Each officer's issued a taser. Okay. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions? I have nothing. Good. The next one we have is the uh, Cardinal Peak upgrade, and this is the system that allows and is actually required uh, to record video and audio when we do interviews and so forth. Uh, the the uh, software is uh, about to expire here in July, and uh, I certainly would recommend that we move forward with this and, uh, and upgrade the, the software. It has been a very beneficial program, and as I said, it's mandated uh, that we do do, do that. So, um, good. Questions on that? No. The uh, next one is the uh, ground penetrating radar and uh, some of you may be aware that uh, we had a situation yeah. <laughs> uh, where a local contractor unearthed some skeletal remains uh, while they were excavating for leaching bed and um, we spent uh, a number of hours devoted to that recovery and uh, actually 56 hours uh, times three officers, so we had 168 hours involved mm -hmm. in in uh, that process that probably could have been um, avoided had we had the ability to check and see if there were, uh, were any remains in that area. Is this something that could be contracted out? I mean, it sounds like it's it's not something that's like it's, I mean, it's relative until it's it's not relative until it's relative right it's I mean, not the relative until here. it's relative but it's yeah. also it's not equipment that's easily accessible to okay. us it was it was used um back in a murder case in south portland years ago um and they had to approach a special company to mm -hmm. get it so having said that then um is it possible to to incorporate this into some kind of county or a regional response to say hey we have this equipment now if biddeford needs to outsource or it yeah, or shared expense yeah or i mean could we maybe recoup some kind of revenue from that or is that not something that's yeah and uh, that's a good good point um we certainly that's this is uh, certainly an issue that we could discuss with the we're, we're a member of the regional crime lab mm -hmm. and um, you know it's it's feasible that we could have that discussion with them and see if that they would be willing to take that on they do have some money that's included with the fee that goes to each community uh, for replacement replacement and or uh, new equipment that comes along that would be helpful to all the communities involved yeah. so certainly that's one that we could take off the table and, and good. approach. Yeah, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting taking but it I off. I think that's a good way to approach it. Yeah, yeah. If we, can get, if we could 
find a way to share those costs or and or receive some other kind of revenue out of it, I think that would be sure. Yeah, it makes it a lot easier to make that decision for sure. The last one is the uh, motorcycle replacement program, and um, that's to replace our uh, the two motorcycles that we have. We found years ago that we started uh, our motorcycle program with a lease program, and uh, because Harley Davidson used to offer a fairly uh, inexpensive lease for a seasonal, and one of the reasons we found out was because they made better profits on it because people actually wanted to buy an actual motorcycle that had been used by the police. So uh, they would lease it to us for a minimal amount, we'd use it for the season, we'd turn it back in, and then they would, uh, they would charge more than a brand new one to, <laughs> because it was authentic. So um, that's how the lease program started, and we did that for a number of years, and then uh, the lease kept creeping up until the point where uh, the sergeant who's responsible for that program looked into it and found that we were actually better off uh, it made financial sense to actually uh, purchase the motorcycle. So we came to the council and, uh, and made our proposal, uh, talked about the, uh, about the community policing aspects of it because our motor officers tell us that, you know, almost every time they stop at a stop sign or a red light if there are other vehicles around, they roll down the window and have a conversation with them. And mm -hmm. we find that in neighborhoods and so forth, it's almost like the old beat cop that people are more apt to have a conversation with them or, or speak Erect. to them than when they're in the car. There's the fuel mileage aspect. It's about five times uh, better fuel mileage and mm -hmm. so forth. Um, so there's a lot of benefits to it, plus the ability to get in and out of traffic and, and so forth in the summertime. And we use them for um, escorts and things as well. So there's a, a lot of uh, good use for them. And when we brought that proposal to the council, uh, I don't remember exactly how many years ago it was, but um, they liked the idea and actually asked asked us to purchase two instead of one. So it was we, five years we did. Ago, I believe. Yeah. I believe it was five, five years. years ago. Um, so we have those. They're 2013 models, and uh, they are approaching their uh, 25,000 miles. They've got just under 20,000 now. By the end of the uh, uh, by the time we'd actually trade them in, by the end of the season. We would be uh, working on twenty-five thousand. Net figure again? No, this is a no. That's a uh, no. That's the where is the, the uh, when we first started? I talked about the monies okay. that we had in the additional revenues for sale of property. Good. Yep. Thank you. Uh, is, is it and, and maybe it's not really that critical with two units, but um, you know we do a standard kind of replacement schedule on vehicles rather than buying two at one. Does it make sense to stagger those out? And do you know one every two or three years, and that that way we're, I, I mm. it's a, it's a it's it's a not a big issue in the size of this budget. I just don't know if that would, if that's something that we could look at versus one, you know, always having both of them do at the same time. Sure. Kind of stagger that out a little bit, but um, it's not critical, not not from my perspective, but might help lower that number just a little bit uh, on a on a regular basis and still get mm -hmm. the equipment that we need. The um, the only drawback that I can see to that is that when we when we buy them together in the same the exact same model the exact same year and so forth that when it comes to parts and things like that we there's also officer familiarity they're not switching from one model to another yeah. they need to they need to be familiar with the controls yeah. and if you have two identical bikes it doesn't matter which one Here. they Here. use right. The other benefit to owning the motorcycles versus leasing is the setup. When you lease, you have to put all the radios, siren lights, and everything on it in the spring. Yep. And then in the fall, when you return the motorcycle, you have to take all the lights and siren and everything off. By doing a five-year program like we've been doing, we set them up, we run them for five years, and then we break them down to trade them in. Yep. So there's a savings there, and we're blessed with Sergeant O'Malley, who does the majority of that work for us. How would you decide on a five-year uh, rotation? Basically, uh, it was built on the mileage. Uh, you know, we talked to a lot of different folks, and we found that the twenty to 25,000-mile range uh, for that type of bike did two things. It, it gave you a, a good, safe uh, bike for that uh, for that period of time, but also was at a point where it was still had some value when we when we wanted to send it out on the other end. Yeah. 
So one last question. It's not on here. Um, where, sure. where do we stand with the drone, drones, and where <laughs> are we at? And I know there's questions about yeah. operators and things like that. Sure. And FAA licenses and requirements. I also know we have a former counselor in town who's working with us on that. Sure. As a key decision maker at the FAA, so that has its perks. I know. But what, could you just give me an update of where we stand with that? Sure. Um, we we uh, had some money donated by a family here in town, and. Um, we have not made the purchase yet. One of the reasons that we didn't is because we wanted to have all the policies and so forth in place and understand all of the uh, liabilities and things that went with it. Um, we have gotten a copy of the uh, Academy policy now and we shipped it uh, down to this unnamed uh, former counselor who has uh, given us some changes to make and so forth and okay. and uh, we're working through that now we've identified a couple of folks on our side that uh, that we would use to go to training because one of the first steps is to get them into some training so we've identified those people and we're looking currently at the training to get them down um, I would also say that uh, I've been approached um, by um, by uh, Mike Shaw about potential uses at public works because he would like to be able to do, you know, take some pictures and so forth, some aerials of yep. infrastructure issues and so forth. So, uh, and his folks uh, down there, the uh, Micah, Micah uh, was kind enough to take some of the information that, uh, that we got uh, from the FAA, different uh, heights and so forth that where you could fly because we're close to the jet port and we were able to overlay that over the town of Scarborough so that we could see if we were on you know on Holmes Road right. what was our what was our ceiling look like uh, yeah. versus yeah. if we were on Gorham Road what does our ceiling look like so yeah, I can see a lot of uh, crossover between departments I mean especially mm -hmm. if we're doing you know economic development sometimes it's nicer to see a bigger picture and planning it's nicer to see that kind of bigger aerial picture mm -hmm. and I think that's becoming more and more prevalent as well. So, the, the, uh, you know, there are there are some drawbacks and there are some um, criticisms of them, and I think a lot of times those are you know invasion of privacy type mm -hmm. issues and so mm -hmm. forth. Um, I would say up front that I have no intention of trying to use a drone for investigative purposes or something. We're, I'm looking at life safety issues. Yep. I, I think it's if we had uh, you know a lost child on Pine Point Beach, the ability to put that up and, and go down the beach, or we have a program for uh, you know special needs uh, folks might be autism, might be a number of different things, yeah. and uh, sometimes those folks are drawn to bodies of water and we identify where those are, but if uh, in certain neighborhoods there could be five bodies of water and mm -hmm. to get officers out to check all of those, uh, it would be much quicker if we could if we could launch and take a quick look and, and that yeah. type of thing. So those are the kinds of things that I'm looking for. Yep. Yeah, I'm not looking for any investigative purposes. Yeah, that's clear. And I, I, I think there's multi-purpose to that, though. I think other departments in town could, could utilize that resource as well in that asset. So that, yeah. to me, that just justi it's more justification for the expense yeah. of operating. We've got. To, I know there's some pretty intense requirements for operators. Mm -hmm. So if we have somebody on staff trained, you know that that's obviously an upside to be able to utilize that in other areas that we need it. Other than just we've also been approached by an individual who, who had a good idea of as we build the building. Uh, to do a flyover weekly or monthly or whatever yeah. to show us sure. progress and so yeah. forth, which would um, really, I, I think there's probably a lot of call for that kind of thing. Good. Other questions? Good. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Pretty much still looks good no matter what he says. What's that? No matter what I say. I didn't say anything. No, I mean, Not him. Yeah. This is a team <laughs> effort. You know what I mean? Can you imagine the increased value when it says written by the chief? <laughs> No, you just put them in the gas tank, the chief. <laughs> <laughs> and we're 10 minutes ahead of schedule, by the way, just for the record. Nothing says we have to go all the way to late. I know. I know. You can't say that in a public building, though. That's right. That's right. <laughs> there are limits to free speech. Uh, we are. Welcome, Michael. Hello. Hello. Good to see all of you. Good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm sure you recognize Tony, but there's a new face with us today yes, that yes. I'd like to introduce. This is our new Deputy Chief, Jerry Lamoria. 
Welcome, nice to welcome nice aboard, to you, Jerry. Thank you. Is he going to do the presenting? Because the new, you know, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Usually the new guy gets broken in fairly regularly around here. Well, so. he's pretty seasoned, and I think he could do a great job if he needed to. So. <laughs> Uh, any comments to start off? I didn't prepare anything formally, uh, Councillor Donovan. I have uh, some talking points for each one of the things, and I'm happy to answer any questions you've got. Good. Let's uh, just start with uh, revenues. revenues. All righty. Wow. Those are on page five of the revenue tab. Uh, total increase in revenues in the fire department total $176,100, or a 17.9% increase this year. And it's really from two different um, parts. The first one is an increase of $100,000 in the EMS billing revenues, or an 11.1% increase. And that's really from a couple of different uh, reasons. The first is the contractor that we use, Comstar, uh, who does our collections, our EMS billing, uh, has made some significant investments in a new clearinghouse and some software upgrades that have proven that they're, they're quite more effective. Um, they're finding insurance coverage better for folks that we weren't able to collect uh, insurance information on, uh, which has improved our, our uh, collection rates with them. They also have a new software system now that kind of, you don't want to be the first one into the claim and have all the deductible go to yours. So they've got a software system that actually kind of holds on motor vehicle crashes and things. Mm -hmm and lets the hospital take the hit to the initial mm -hmm. claim and submits ours a little bit later mm -hmm. in hopes mm -hmm. of trying to maximize. So between those couple of different initiatives and the call volume, um, we're comfortable in increasing our EMS revenues significantly this year. Terrific. The uh, second part of that is last year, you may recall, we instituted a part-time billing clerk in the fire department. And I, I'm pleased to report that she has more than earned her keep. and. Um, when we get claims that Comstar isn't able to uh, take care of, we're putting that extra effort into some personal touch and phone calls and follow-ups uh, that has paid dividends. And those resources, uh, those revenues, uh, have helped us to to be able to increase that. Where, where, do we, where do we stand on the fee structure? I know that was some some discussion last year around that, um, and. I, I expressed some concerns about asking for credit cards before we transport it, but um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's how you open the door now. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, I know that was a, that was a, 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 something that was brought up. So are we are we in are we I guess how can I say this right? Are we in the norm, if you will, for for service? We fees? do keep an eye on what other services are charging. I think okay. we are in the norm. We did okay. not. Is this normally? Let me back up. Our fee schedule allows us to adjust based on the uh, Medicaid allowable rates each year. We did not make an adjustment at January 1st this year because actually the Medicare rates went down a slight amount because of an expiring uh, surcharge. There was There is still legislation pending to reinstate that, so rather than get out a few pennies and just then right, turn right, around and go back up, yep. we just left things the same. It, yep. it really didn't amount to too much. So there is not a, a fee increase baked into this proposal this year. And the second uh, revenue increase is in the inspection and permit fees line, which is uh, $73,000 or a 140% increase. And that really is due to what we did last year in the current FY18 budget. We did take a significant increase in the square foot uh, cost of our construction permit package, which pays for the fire inspectors, plan reviews, and the construction inspections. Um, and as a very conservative budget person, I, I really underestimated the, S, the uh, revenues in this current year. I wanted to see what those new rates really produced before I went out on a limb. Uh, and based on the increase in rates, uh, a new fee that we put in place last year, so instead of one of the things that we would, were doing is renovations and, and large remodel jobs, because they weren't enlarging the building, there wasn't a square foot cost. So we were doing multi-million dollar renovations and getting a $35 minimum permit fee where the inspector was spending as much time as a brand new construction out there every day mm -hmm. going through the project. So we instituted a uh, new fee for remodeling that is based on the cost of the project versus the square footage. And that was in the fee schedule? Last year. Last year, fee schedule adjustment. Good. Yes. Good. So those two things have really brought in much more revenue than we anticipated. We're well over budget with our revenue number on a good way uh, yeah. in the current fiscal year. 
And then based on the volume in, in work, uh, similar to what Jay talked about from the planning department, um, between the volume of last year and what we already have on the books for next year, we were comfortable in, in uh, increasing this revenue line significantly this year. And, and can you put can you put this into perspective of where we're at, let's say, versus surrounding communities in terms of that fee structure? I honestly can't because there aren't okay. many that are doing it the way that we do. We, okay. we have uh, had a very proactive fire inspection process for a number of years now, and these fees are something that not many other departments are are doing. Yeah, and my only concern would be I don't know if we're getting any pushback from from cost of doing business or permitting fees or anything. I haven't heard anything, so I don't want to I don't want to kick that hornet's nest. But I also would like to try and get out ahead of it if we have to before having to react to something of you know too much red tape or something like that. You know, and, and we are hypersensitive to that as well. And, okay. and to be honest, there have been very few complaints okay. with the changes that were made last year. Okay. And I guess the final thing I, I'd like to mention about that revenue line is that the permit inspection fees now cover, uh, with this proposal this year, will now cover the entire cost of our full-time fire inspector slash code enforcement officer that Jay spoke to um, earlier and that I'll speak well to again. Yep. Yeah. Let's move to uh, expenditures. Yeah, tab, tab 4, page 54. So in terms of the expenditures, instead of going through, we've got five sub-budgets, as you may remember, uh, administration, EMS, suppression, fire prevention, and EMS, AMA, yep. I mean. Um, I just looked at it in one uh, total budget. The fire department's uh, increase this year is uh, projected to be 251279 or 5%. And I broke it down, uh, as the finance department did, in terms of the major categories of what those expenses are. So, under wage and benefits, we have an increase of about 200, just under 240,000, or about 5.3 percent. Uh, the reasons for those, uh, the the primary reason for that, is the transfer of the fire inspector from the planning department. So, Jay, when he was up here, talked about how we were doing some realignment, yeah. and that in the planning department, he has left the same level of service there. What actually is happening is the full-time fire inspector slash code officer that we have shared for the last four years, this budget recommends moving him into my budget. So those costs have been carried in the planning department for the last four years. I'm in these numbers and in this budget and proposing to pick up those costs and then Jay's office will end up adding a commercial code enforcement officer to help pick up this extra work that this recent development is um, bringing. About how much is that? So that... Of uh, the 238? Of the 238, $102,000 is the total cost of that transfer, if you will, or realignment, and that includes all the, uh, the salary benefits and the contractual costs that go with it. So if you back that number out, uh, because that is a current position that's already funded within the municipal okay. budget, my increase in uh, wage and benefits would be 135823 or 3.0%. And that covers our typical <coughs> cost of living uh, and contractual benefits with the union and everything else in the fire department. It's worth noting that prior to this experiment of the shared position, the fire department historically had two part-timers that <coughs> provided these functions and did a lot more, I think, in the fire prevention area as well. That, um, uh, and at the same time, we had a full-time uh, code inspect inspector here. As Jay mentioned, through attrition and openings, there was an opportunity to try the shared service. We've been keeping up on the code inspection end of things, but I, I think Chief Thurlow would tell you that there's a lot of other stuff, particularly on the fire side, that has taken a back seat. Um, you know, we've got inspections that need to get done. There's just no question about it. But things like fire prevention and other more proactive things uh, have not been advanced. And so it's really getting back to where we were four years ago in many respects. So we are. If, I, if I could real quick on the 3% general, I know we, um, you, you, your department was the um, first, or guinea pig, I guess, if you will, for the new benefits approach, right? Um, are we going to, will we start seeing that number adjusted based on that or I know we weren't expecting a big decrease in costs based on that short term we were expecting that kind of baked in over time 
um, in terms of how we structure the benefits package. I don't know where where that's going to start showing up maybe next year or the following year? Or? No, a lot of it is baked into this year it because is. most okay. of those, there were some that were only a half-year implementation. The insurance, for example, yep. uh, only hit one half in this year. So this is the first year of the, the difference in the insurance program with the collective bargaining agreement. Okay. Um, so some of that is already baked into these numbers. Okay. And again, because I'm such a nice guy, there's some of those costs that are shown in the executive <laughs> line until we get some sense. The, I think the HRA financing is... Utilization. The utilization. The insurance um, utilization. We need a first year and some experience to really understand how that's all going to work. Um, and it made more sense to put it on the executive <laughs> side for the first year. Anyway. But the intention is to shift that over back to a fire eventually, or so that we get a full accounting in the right area for that, right? Yeah, so it's going to be interesting. Our intent is to roll this out to other departments. So right mm -hmm. now it's fire only, but yep. I assure you we're going to have this conversation with police and mm -hmm. move through the uh, the other um, groups as well. So mm -hmm. it may it may always reside in the executive uh, executive session uh, section of the budget. So no personnel increase. There is no personnel increase in here. This is strictly the uh, existing personnel plus moving the inspectors over. Yeah. Uh, and, and I just want to echo Jay's comments there. I very much support this change, um, not only because I think individually this person fits. He's got a very um, balanced skill set and, and certifications that, that you wouldn't find normally. Um, and it's, it's going to be much easier to hire a, a commercial code enforcement officer than it is to replace this person, but I just think the fit works well, and, and certainly with the volume of work coming in the office last year, this current year, and going forward, uh, this is very badly needed. So I, I firmly support bringing this on. Can you, can you talk a little bit of what the, you know, the Chief Moulton mentioned, um, enhanced Fire calls, enhanced 911 fire calls, or what was the what was the on um, the EFD? Side? Yeah, he talked about what's called EFD. It's uh, emergency fire dispatching. Okay. So when you call for an a EMS call, if you call with a heart attack, you've been accustomed for a number of years now to get a bunch of different questions, um, very scripted. They're, they're based on a national script, and then advice on what to do as you're waiting for the ambulance to get there. Mm -hmm. There is now a similar product for fire dispatching. So if you call up with a house fire, you'll get scripted national vetted uh, questions and that same type of advice for your fire call. And Does, it's also a police function that eventually sure, the state's sure. going to move to as well. Does that help us in our responses? I mean, I, know, I think typically now when one bell rings, like everybody answers, right? It's a, you get you get multiple vehicles and multiple response teams or something, right? Yeah, that's the intent. We okay. have really been ahead of that curve. So even before this system was in place, we had tailored our own custom uh, run cards based on what needs to go to what types of calls. So okay. it hasn't necessarily changed how we're doing business an awful lot. We always have tried to send the minimum amount needed to different mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. um, but it does, I think, help the dispatches by uh, being much more standardized. It is nationally vetted and, and uh, I think, a much safer way to, to go. And the bottom line is it's a state mandate that we have yep. to do yeah, one yeah. way or the other. Yeah, I, I was just I mean, responding. Obviously, 70% of your calls are EMS calls. Correct. You know, and that's that's I think we have what two ambulances and one in standby. Correct. So that's seems like you know those crews are working twenty four seven, and I'm not suggesting the other crews aren't either. But it sounds like they're they're taking the brunt of the services. <laughs> and those other call, those other yeah. crews go and help on those EMS calls as well, even okay. though they don't transport okay. anything of any seriousness. That neighborhood truck <clears throat> goes as well to. So, th it. so those those EMS uh, uh, rescue and emergency EMS calls aren't only ambulance. There's there could be a fire response associated with that or a truck response with that as well. Correct. All okay. of the serious calls get an engine's response as gotcha. well because okay. they are the closest unit, and a lot of times they'll be able to provide uh, the initial care before the ambulance can get there. Right? Yeah, the uh, uh, Mike has been involved with the uh, Metro Regional Coalition's effort to analyze. Uh, utilization of fire and emergency services, and uh, and it was evident that the, across the entire region, uh, eighty percent or so of all calls were EMS calls. And did did that come as a surprise? Or was that kind of 
well known. Oh, no, we all knew you, one. You, yeah. yeah, came certainly as those of the municipal officials who were looking at it were amazed at how, because of the, obviously those are health related conditions and that you think of a fire department as fires. But in point of fact, what you are really doing is providing emergency medical care uh, to the community on an everyday basis. Thousands of calls. For me, it's helpful to see if we could see some kind of, and it doesn't need to be down finite, but uh, maybe an equipment breakdown kind of thing where, you know, what percentage of the calls are just ambulance? Because when I look at that, and I'm sure people in the public look at that, they think that's all ambulance calls. Why do we have all this other apparatus or why, what's the purpose? Why don't we have five ambulances or seven ambulances to meet this? So it, it, I think it might help to, to have a better description maybe of how those calls are handled and, and how the responses are done. Because I think, and, I don't, and maybe we can't do that, I don't know. But it, it, looking at this, it, to me, as a layperson, not knowing when the bell rings, who's going to respond, I look at that and say, that's, that's almost all ambulance. You know? And I don't know how you, I don't know how to explain that better to the community to say, it's not, that's not correct. There's, there's, a, there's a different response plan. There's a different way that we do it. And, and maybe a little more detail behind that. Yeah, I think the simple solution or the simple answer is that we still have to be prepared for fire, and that, oh, that's absolutely. what the department was started for. Right. And essentially, we've got six stations in the six traditional neighborhoods that were formed back in the 30s. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason Scabro, you know, a lot of these communities are catching up to EMS. Scabro was a starter. In 1953, we started the first rescue in the state of Maine, and we're very proud of that. And, the, and EMS has always been an integral part of what we've done since the 50s. So we're, we're ahead of the curve in terms of EMS, and, and one of the reasons we are is that if you have a heart attack in Pine Point, you get the Pine Point truck to your door within right. three, four Trained minutes. People. Exactly. Train people right. with an right. AED, right. with the medical right. See, that's, knowledge and, and, and equipment, and that, even though it comes on a fire truck. That, absolutely, and I think that's critical, because I think that's what people need to understand is that you're, 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 you're paying for that response time. Correct. And I think I just want to avoid the misconception that, you know, only fire tr or only ambulances respond to EMS calls. It's it is the full the full benefit of all the resources that Correct. are there. So uh, I don't, I don't know how to highlight that, um, but you know maybe it's more of a narrative thing. I guess I, I don't well, know. Well, I think the chief's saying when you have yeah. when you have a facility that's nearest to the location where the emergency is occurring, you're going to send whether it's yeah. a. a it could be a pickup truck for all I care. Yeah, I, it doesn't matter. Exactly. And in most yeah. cases, that's exactly what it is. Instead yeah. of driving the engine to a house call for a heart right. attack, right. we do send an ancillary truck just right. because it's cheaper sure. and yep. less expensive, yep. Yep. easier on maintenance, and, yep. and all those yep. other things. But the key is the staff and the, and the medical right. 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 Yeah, the medical training to be able to deal with it. And that's yep. sophisticated. Yep. Yep. Good. Other questions on uh, uh, revenue go to capital budget? Yep. Yep. So I, just before we go to the uh, the capital stuff um, on the net budget. I just wanted to, to highlight the net fire department budget increase is seventy five thousand one hundred seventy eight, or less than two percent. And if we backed out that uh, fire inspector position, we'd actually be down in a twenty seven thousand dollar reduction from FY eighteen, um, or a net budget of point uh, six seven percent. So I, we really scoured every line. It did look good. It really did. And then in terms of unmet needs, yeah, I thanks just wanted. For the manager, though. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Tom will take the hit on that. <laughs> and just one minute on, on unmet needs before we get to capital. Uh, I did not want to go away without talking about the staffing plan because we have worked very hard Good. on that since 2003. We've done a number of uh, updates to that plan. We knew this year going in because of the revenue shortfall and, and getting down to the minimum receivership that coming forward with staffing this year wasn't going to move. But I did make sure that we included in the exhibit, uh, and it does show up on page eight of the exhibits 1D, um, the justification for the, the staffing plan. Um, we've been trying to, to get four full-time people, which is what it takes to put one new person on 24-7. And uh, in terms of an unmet need, the, the dollar amount for that that was cut before it got to you folks uh, was $281,593. I just want to make sure that 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 staffing still stays in our forefront of our minds, even though I know it's going to be difficult to do that this year. Yeah, and I mean, your your call numbers tell the story. I mean, they just keep going up and up. 
and the call force and so you the call the, members well, to handle yeah. them keep going down right your staff uh, is, is the level of quality of care is directly related to having people who can answer those calls good capital projects we don't have any uh, so we're on capital equipment and we're page one of that narrative tab six tab six one. Yeah. page one. One. So we have five projects this year. The first one is 98500 for the rescue re-chassis. Uh, this is uh, funded by EMS billing revenue, so this is not a bond or a uh, appropriation. This is the third year of a three-year cycle where this is the third one that we've rotated out. You may recall, historically, we used to replace an ambulance every three years while they were still in warranty. And even though we, we staffed two, we have a third one, as you mentioned. Uh, we found that as the cost of ambulances kept rising, uh, it, I did an analysis five years ago and decided that it was no longer cost effective to be able to do that. So we went to a five-year re-chassis model and replaced the whole unit after 10. And we're now, this will be the third year where we've gone through that first cycle of rechassing re uh, a truck. So that's. What, what was that revenue, Chief? I'm sorry, what, you said that was from a. Billing. The rescue reserve. Billing, account. okay. Yes, EMS billing. I think it's important to note that in your analysis, you did provide the projection that you would save 180000 over 10 years. Correct. I think that's pretty, pretty critical to understand. Yep. The second item is related to the ambulance. It's, I'm sorry, there was one other line here. So the next item in the narrative is 52500 for major apparatus maintenance. This is a historic um, effort that we have done halfway through the anticipated life of a major apparatus. And we've called that 25 years for a number of years now. So at about the 10, 12 year range, uh, we've been going into our frontline uh, pumpers and aerials, repainting, going right through them from head to stern um, to make sure that they're going to make the end of their useful life. Public Works takes care of this for us. Um, some of the work they do in-house, some of it is, is sent out to, to different subcontractors, but it's just an investment that uh, for a truck that's worth somewhere between 600 and over a million dollars, it's a, a very small investment halfway through their life to make sure that they are still dependable and able to meet their uh, requirements. So most of this is going to show up on the revenue side of public works then, correct? Or is this for, this for like contracted services that, that public works is A lot of it is contract services. They do some of it in-house, in but most of it is contracted out. It's paint work that they haven't got the capabilities to do down there now. Okay. The third item is the $44,000 ambulance power structure that I started to say was part of the ambulance one. As we've redone, uh, re chassied these trucks, this is the third power structure system that we're going to be putting in because it's a combination of a, a new stretcher itself, but also a receiver. So now instead of the back injuries that we used to get before we had power stretchers, now you, you roll this stretcher up and it actually lifts it right up into the truck. So it's, uh, it Good. minimizes the opportunity to drop a patient right. and the back injuries associated so, with absolutely. one of our most common workman's comp cases. Good technological advancement. Yeah, absolutely. And because it has a component that's built into the truck, we've it just was cost effective to do it when we reach chassis. The next one is $50,000 for a staff vehicle. That is uh, actually to replace Deputy Atado's vehicle after 13 years of service. Can you get B slash T? Can you remind me again what the, what the T is? I question that myself. myself. Yeah, I bet that it is. Well, a combination of going with the T. Yeah, on, on the... Tab 6, page 2. It's on, on tab 6, page trade 2, fourth on it is trade. Yeah, there is a, a trade value that is okay. shown on the revenue side. Yeah. yeah. Tab 6, page 2. Okay. And then the final one is 86250 That was for the new safety and PPE 
uh, line item. This would be the second year of a two-year program to replace, the, the bulk of the money is to replace our obsolete uh, bunker gear, turnout gear, that is over 10 years old. There is a little bit of money in this account to also replace uh, some of the dry marine rescue and ice water suits that we've got that have uh, got to the end of their service life. So this is year two of a two-year plan. Good. Good. Other questions? Uh, I guess maybe just to, um, no. That's all good. It's all good. Thanks, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice, nice to meet you. Nice, nice to meet you. you. Yeah. Welcome. These are all new faces. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody wants to be in Scarborough. <laughs> uh, do, 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 do. Uh, Tom, what takes place uh, under Item Five General Budget Discussion? Is that the recap? No, well, that's after. No, yeah, I think seven. that's. I think that was just a placeholder for yeah, any answer with issues. Okay. Item six, future meetings. So I just want to uh, reiterate. For the, I mean, the council and the staff now. So I cannot. Um, oh, I thought there was actually a meeting next Tuesday. Is that the twenty sixth? That's no, the that's Thursday. Is there a meeting Tuesday as well, twenty fourth? I don't. Not that I'm aware. Oh, I thought somebody told me there was. Okay. Today is Tuesday. Tuesday. So Thursday, I'll the 26th. I'll be here for all this. This was Wednesday, Thursday. but we now have the public yeah, yeah, hearing, yeah. so it's pushed it. For some reason, I thought there was a yeah. finance meeting on the 24th, but am I wrong? Okay. Uh, I, I will not be present on the 26th, unfortunately. I'm out of town that whole week. Okay. I'll, uh, so you might have to do I'll it. Do, I'll do it. Looks uh, like we're all taking turns having to miss at least one. Unfortunately, right, I have to pay my mortgage. Anymore. I have to pay my mortgage, so it's, you know. know. Good. All right. So I'll make a note to be there on the 26th. Yeah. As long as you really rake library over the coals from it. No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll do set cover. I'll be giving them a raise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Love the library. Uh, let's uh, 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 do a meeting recap. I had three items. Uh, um, the uh, uh, reval, the residential reval uh, in the assessing budget would be looked at from uh, the perspective of uh, whether to bond it. Funding mechanism. Mm -hmm. uh, the yeah. office renovation was the same. Could you just put dollar values next to that? So I think the... the 415. 450. Four, was it four, no, 415. 415. Yeah. Yeah, 25 yeah. for office renovation. Yep. Yeah. And the uh, ground penetrating radar uh, was the third thing that I had. And what, that 16,000, I think it was? I gotta look at the tab. Yes. Yes. 16,000. Good. And I, I'd like to ask, because I missed the last meeting, if we could add one item, um, which I can explain at that, uh, you know, when we get to the end, um, and that's around the community services budget. And, um, you know, I wanna have a conversation about increasing the revenues. Okay. And I'll save the conversation for later. No, I know what you're, yeah. 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 it's that self-sustaining concept that, yes. yeah. that we're all trying to, when we have a, uh, a recreational or kind of a wants not needs, let's see if we can have a user-based fee system. Uh, good. Anything uh, else? That anything? We need? Uh, Tom, anything that you're anything looking for for recap or anything like that? No, I think I mentioned at the end of last me, uh, last, yeah, last budget review, uh, we did get the main state revenue sharing numbers in. Um, that's a $38,000 increase in revenues, so that's good news. I might just record that here, mm -hmm. uh, just so we have a kind of a running total. Mm -hmm. uh, beyond that, we're, I think the school is still waiting on confirmation on their uh, health insurance numbers, so uh, they'll inform that as soon as they know. But that's all I have for tonight. Yeah, I, I mean, I think the number that shocked me the most of, uh, of the evening was how uh, rapidly the property values in town are getting out of whack with the assessed values. Uh, and it really in, uh, sort of reinforces what we did several months ago to start with a 68% present commercial industrial uh, valuation to, uh, uh, to fair market value. That's, and I, I, yeah, I mean, part of that bonding discussion, too, would be I don't necessarily think we need to wait 10 years to keep doing revaluations. That's worst-case scenario. Yeah. So that might be part of the financing discussion as well. I know we said it might be a year or two or three at the most, but mm -hmm. 
that's certainly something else to think about. Yeah. What's the lifespan of the project? So, so I do have one question under general budget uh, discussion. I guess. Um, at what point are we going to understand better the impact of the commercial revaluation as far as in this uh, budget? I know we've tried to make sure that we kind of in a way silo our conversations um, understandably because the, um, it's so unknown. Well, at what point will we have some perspective? They have uh, the the field work is underway. It started in earnest last week, so this is week two. And I've hesitated, though very interested and anxious myself, to, to ask that very question. But I want to give them a little more time. I I'm, I don't expect that we'll have anything on uh, the letterhead of the consultant um, that will tell us what that number is. But I think we'll have a much better sense, such that I can do some forecasting and modeling, um, even though it may be con conservative. Um, I think that work's going to continue probably s past the time that you'll be adopting your budget. It, it will certainly be done in, in, in place and in hand for the commitment in August. Uh, there's no question there, but to gain value of it in this conversation, in this context, <coughs> we'll need to have some better refined numbers so we can reproject what impact there might be on the tax rate. And I, I'm confident we'll do that before your second reading. Yeah, I think that, 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 that ought to be part of the, that <coughs> list as well, because I mean, I think yeah. that's something that we need to take up into consideration with. And, and when, it's, all, it's expenses and revenue, when, right? When, I mean, that's the whole the, thing that we're looking at. When the finance committee meets for the last time right. to agree upon the adjustments that ought to be made as a part of a second yes. reading right. presentation, that would be right. one of the pieces. And, and that's I, what I was, I want to make sure that it's part of that because, I, I mean, let's be clear, lines are being drawn already about the budget, about what's optimistic, what's worst case, um, how bad it could be, how bad it might not be. And I just think that we, even though we may have wanted to take a more cautious approach in understanding that, um, it needs to be, it needs to be addressed head on. Yeah, but I think to Tom's point, it, it needs to be understood that oh, whatever we do is going to be an estimate. Absolutely. We, then we have to decide as a committee and as a council whether we want to be conservative, middle of the road, or aggressive right. with that estimate right. and, and make our decision based on that. Yeah. But it is still an estimate. It's right. not going to be fixed and firm and final. I think it would be great to, uh, to update this group, the Finance Committee, uh, probably as part of your final recommendation, that final meeting you have to make a recommendation to the council. And, and clearly the full council needs to understand as best we can by mm -hmm. May 16th what that impact's Absolutely. going to be. Yeah. And, yeah. and I'm confident we can, you know, I've, I've, I've already modeled it based on the, on the ratios. We can certainly do that again. And I've hesitated including that so far. I, I didn't want to get oh, that's, that's, that's fair. That's fair. I, 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 I think you've been right yeah. to reserve judgment on yeah. it till we have as much, you right. can model it on the data that we already have in-house, yeah. as well as the work that will be well advanced in another month plus. Uh, before we get to May 16th. Yeah, I, don't, I don't think that number impacts anything that we're doing up until right now, the last, no, no, up no, until no, the no, last I, meeting. I agree. I agree. Yeah. My sense of that, the impact, it will be substantial. And so I even agree. if we take a conservative view, which I will recommend we do, I think it will still be meaningful to mm -hmm. the bottom line That's and right to point. your point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Other? Motion to adjourn. Some a public comment? Public comment. Anyone wishing to... I may come and I can see two people lift, lifting, lifting out of their seats. I don't seats. think they were going to make public comments, though. <laughs> yeah, they already made their comments. Right. Uh, seeing none, uh, I'll accept the motion to adjourn. So Second. All in favor? We are adjourned. Thank you. <laughs> they used to say at Maine Maritime, do not anticipate the command. <laughs>